Islam is a religion of law and to bring about the perfect Islamic state as its goal. All Muslims are required to follow Sharia law, but where does Sharia come from? The real answer may shock you. Last time, we really gave a, just a brief introduction uh, to Sharia. In fact, I think we called it uh, Sharia sacred or secret. And today we are going to continue with the same theme, at least for the most part. And with me here, of course, in our studio, virtually, our dear brother Lloyd de Jong, who I thought did an excellent job in bringing to the forefront uh, some aspects of Sharia and tying it to groups like ISIS, for instance, and some of the um, you know terrorist attacks that took place, and basically to show that there is nothing. Uh, you know, secret about Sharia when it comes to fulfilling its mandates and its requirements. The only secrecy is that those who follow uh, uh, ma the mandates of Sharia try to keep it that way out of fear of retaliation or exposing the actions to the authorities or maybe they have other ulterior motives. Whatever the case might be, we will continue to methodically expose things to you from Islamic sources when it comes to Sharia. Uh, Brother Lloyd, thank you so much again for uh, joining me uh, to continue with our discussions on this topic, a very important topic, if I may add. Well, thank you for having me back, Alfani. Very honored. So where would you like to uh, start this time? I know we ended somewhere last time. I think that's the, uh, you're going to show us the slide where we finished, and then you want to carry on from there. Pick up where we left off, and I'll move forward. Yeah. So I showed that Muslims are not allowed to teach any of the sacred law of the Islamic law, the Sharia or the Fiqh, to non-Muslims. So, and also, if we want to learn it, we are learning it in bad faith. We are learning it to harm Islam, and therefore, they must not reveal this knowledge to us. Now, notice this is called the Maqasid al-Sharia, literally the aims or purposes of the law. Mm -hmm. Now, Islam is a legal system; it is also a political system. So, and what are the purposes of this system? Well, in legal theory, the idea that the Sharia is a system that encompasses aims or purposes, not merely a collection of inscrutable rulings. Notice the word inscrutable. This is something that is hidden, something that is not known. So it admits that the Sharia is meant to be a secret. It's meant to be unknown, inscrutable. But it has an aim. It has a purpose. So the Sharia short version is the ultimate distillation of the Quran, the Sunnah, Call it the Hadith, the Tafsir. All of this knowledge, all of this body has been distilled into the Sharia. This is the final interpretation of all of the above. It's the application, the full exegesis of all of Islam's knowledge. It took about 900 years to finally create the Sharia. Wonderful. Wonderful. Right. So what we're going to be doing through the series is demystifying Sharia. We're going to clarify what Sharia is in relationship to the Quran and the Sunnah. We're going to show where it is found. We're going to detail its terminology and its rulings. We're going to define its role. We're going to identify Islam's major doctrines. We're going to move beyond verses in the Quran and hadiths. We're going to, these things created doctrine. This doctrine created laws. We're going to look at the doctrine, the major doctrines of Islam. There are certain fundamental doctrines. And then we're going to look at how those are expressed in law. We're going to address misconceptions. We're going to show Islam's divisions, levels, and authority structure. We will examine how, when, where, and why the Sharia was created. We're going to trace its historical and political development. And as certainly it was developed with political aims in mind, we're going to also compare the Sharia versus the Talmud Bavli or the Babylonian Talmud. We're going to see the plagiarism and the, as well as the corruption of what is in the Talmud. Then we're going to look at, when I say corruption in the Talmud, they've taken the Talmud, they've plagiarized and inverted a number of its rulings. They've altered them. They've made them unrecognizable in many cases. We're going to look at its importance as the final product and the end goal of Islam, which is the will of Allah, which has to be imposed by persuasion, persuasion, read propaganda, or by force. Wonderful. So, does this summarize at least the intent of this series? Uh, is it fair to say that? Yes. Excellent. Yes. So people now have an idea about 
what this series will entail. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to, every point here will be one show. It could be multiple shows, but at least you, you can follow with us right now as the viewers, the train of thoughts and the uh, systematic approach that we will be taking here. So thank you, brother, for providing this. Please continue. Very welcome. Right. So, so that everyone knows, these are some of the major sources that I'm using. I've listed this the document called the Islamic and Talmudic Jurisprudence, the four roots of Islamic law and their Talmudic counterparts by Judith R. Wegner. This is the link on the webs on, on their website, on the JSTOR website. However, all the links to every single document I'm using will be in the description. Every single item that I will be using here and showing here will be available for the audience to download, as we said. Was our Shafi the master architect of Islamic jurisprudence by Wa'el B. Halak? Very good article. However, he is an apologist for Islam, so one has to bear that in mind. Reliance of the Traveler, this is the world's most popular Islamic law or sacred law manual, the Umdat al-Salik, the Manual of Sacred Islamic Law. I will also reference, amongst others, the Hedaya. This we will get to later. It is a very important, very large, very complex Islamic law manual. A couple of additional sources, the Brill Encyclopedia of Islam, 13 volumes. This is the major academic resource on Islam. To buy this will cost you about $40,000. The Brill Encyclopedia of the Quran, six volumes. I have no idea what that costs. We will look at, amongst others, the Digest of Muhammadan Law. We look at the Ihya Ulama Din, the revival of the religious sciences by Muhammad Al Ghazali. And we will refer to other authoritative legal and academic sources as required. All links available below. Wonderful, brother. Thank now, you. Okay, so Quran 42 13. Allah has laid down for you the same deen the way of life and belief. Now, Islam does not refer to itself as a religion. We in the West, we utilize that term. We as Christians utilize the term. However, Islam refers to itself as a deen, and we need to understand Islam as a deen, and we have to look at what is a deen. How is it different from religion? Well, it's a political system. But let's continue here. This is the same deen which Allah had commanded to Noah and which have enjoined on you and which we have bequeathed to Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, so that they should establish the religion and not be divided amongst themselves. Well, we do know there are distinct, vast differences, irreconcilable differences between Christianity and Islam. However, this is what they are taught. Now, according to the scholar al Sharani, it's the second time we've seen him. He was mentioned earlier. He was very critical in the development of Islam, one of the final scholars. He's, he's the guy that put the cherry on the cake, if you will. It is obligatory to act according to the Sharia of the Prophet and to abstain from that which was abrogated from the Sharia of Jesus. So we need to bear that in mind. So Islam sees that Christianity was a religion of law, which it is not, while Islam itself is a religion of law. Right. The caveat. So yes, Al-Fari? Yeah, I mean, I agree with you because you hear these arguments from Muslims is like always asking you, so well, are, do you still follow the law or not? That's where they're coming from. The idea that Islam adheres to the law, you guys don't adhere to it anymore. Correct. And there's a difference. You know, there are vast, we will discuss those. We get to those distinctions as we go. Now, a caveat. This is from Judith Wegner in this document, Islamic and Talmudic Jurisprudence. Severe limitations are imposed by the scarcity of early Islamic legal material and the complete lack of pre-Islamic Arabian legal texts. Research is further hampered by the probability that doctrinal consideration led to the expunging, the deletion, the erasure of any references to foreign sources from the early legal texts. That's why in the early slide I showed that Islam has borrowed over 2,000 words from other languages, especially Hebrew, Aramaic, Syriac, and Greek. And as we go through the Sharia, we will find out that yes, those ideas have been incorporated from those cultures or legal systems, and they've erased the originals. They've erased the sources they got them from. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for doing that. Please continue. All right. So from Arab legal culture to the Talmud. So Islamic law developed beyond region-specific Arab customary laws in the 8th and the 9th centuries with the jurisprudential bases of the Babylonian Talmud. What this means is that in each little region, you had these different cultures all involved in Islam. They all had their own little specific laws and customs. And unfortunately, for political purposes, to build a state, to build a nation, the Ummah, and we will learn more about how they had this perfect state that they had envisioned, they needed to have the same set of ideas across all of them to avoid contradiction because there was contradiction. Things were being noticed. Jewish and Islamic law are theocratic legal systems resting on the concept of a divine law revealed to a prophet in a scripture. For Jews, that is the Torah. For Muslims, the Quran. Rabbinic law developed during the first five centuries AD, culminating in the editing 
of the Talmud in the 6th century. It distinguishes civil, moral, and ceremonial law. Now, Jewish law has evolved. It has changed morally. And of course, if you look at Israel today, modern Israel, it does not apply Talmudic law the way it was then. It doesn't, doesn't even apply the law of the Torah, except for perhaps civil and, sorry, ceremonial and moral law. Christianity has a moral law, but Islam, in many ways, does not distinguish whatsoever between civil, moral, and ceremonial law. Islamic law initially developed during the 7th to 9th centuries, culminating in the classical theory of Islamic jurisprudence. It does not separate mosque and state. However, it only finished full development in the 14th century or later. We'll see, in fact, it probably goes to the 16th century to the 1500s when it was finished. There are strong Talmudic parallels, and you can even say plagiarism, with the legal theory of Imam Shafi. Imam Shafi is the one most critical for crafting how Sharia developed as a legal system, as a political system, with a borrowing of fundamental con concepts from the Talmud Bavli. And also, given the relative scarcity of legal provisions in the Qur'an, which Shafi will tell us in a moment, and the Qur'an was not intended to be a comprehensive law code, this was inevitable that they needed to develop a comprehensive legal and political code. Right. And, and by the way, the, 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 the use of the Babylonian Talmud as an example is excellent here and brilliant because that's what the Jews did. And uh, while they were in exile, they started at this body of rulings because guess what? They were not in Jerusalem anymore. The temple has been destroyed and they have to come up with different ways to interpret, uh, you know, certain actions and rituals. So that you can see the similarities now and the correlation between the two. Yes. Yes. I'll end on this slide on this one. If that's so. We're looking at the Mujtahid Mutlaq Shafi. This word is very important. This one's highlighted, Mujtahid Mutlaq. We will get into all of these definitions. Imam Shafi said, the Quran texts are couched in very general terms, which it is the function of the Sunnah to expand and elucidate, to make Allah's meaning absolutely clear. Certainly, but then beyond the Sunnah, we then move to the Sharia. So, and the Fiqh. Wonderful. So, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, so, Basically, the Qur'an is not complete on its own, and Imam Shafi confirms this for us. He required, in fact, he was the one that made the Sunnah a requisite source to interpret the Qur'an. Absolutely, and this is very damaging, by the way, when you think about it, uh, technically speaking, that uh, it, right there you have a very well-known, prominent uh, Islamic clerk uh, who is telling you the Qur'an, uh, if it stands on its own, it's definitely not sufficient. Uh, so you're going to need other bodies of sacred writings, in this case, or sayings, uh, or rulings, if I may add, uh, to interpret it for you and to allow you to have a fuller picture that is sufficient for a society. Yes. Wonderful. We'll what should we expect? We'll... Oh, what, sorry. what should we expect next time? Next time I will show I will start showing the application of some of the laws. So I'm not going to separate it. I will be showing next time I will show the application of some of these laws, how from the Quran into the Sunnah, into the Sharia, and how this created doctrine and law. And we will see how this affects Islamic behavior, the behavior of Muslims. We will see how it changes their, their dealings with others. And you will start to see how this actually filters back into the real world. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, this is Al Fadi. And if you tuned in uh, to watch this, this is our uh, massive, hopefully, uh, video series on Sharia, the Muslim Talmud. Uh, if you're enjoying this, uh, please share it with others and feel free to also interact with us in the comments section. Thank you, brother. Thank you, everyone. This is Al Fadi. God bless you. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sira International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.